ADHD has a two-dimensional structure. It's composed of uh, an area of inattention and an area of hyperactivity and impulsivity. These two dimensions are usually correlated, uh, so cases have to be approached on a case-by-case -case basis. So no case is going to be like another. Under inattention, it centers around a lack of persistence or effort uh, in sustaining attention to tasks. This is usually apparent in uh, situations like free play. Uh, children will um, move from one activity to another without engaging in prolonged play. Uh, it can be apparent in schoolwork or homework or chores. Uh, low priority activities um, are very hard for ADHD children to maintain attention toward those types of tasks. And um, <clears throat> you can see it in their responding to extraneous events. Uh, this means that uh, usually if you're talking to a child with ADHD, they'll become easily distracted and um, start talking about things that aren't um, along the topic that's being discussed. The other side of ADHD involves impulsivity. This is a deficiency in, in the ability to inhibit behavior. It's usually also associated with hyperactivity, uh, it, but it may be the source cause of the hyperactivity. Impulsivity in adulthood tends to have two distinct dimensions uh, as opposed to in childhood. Uh, it, impulsivity in adulthood tends to center around either motor impulsivity or, symbols, uh, or symptoms related to verbal behavior. So they'll have a hard time controlling what they're saying. Uh, it's like they don't have a filter. The diagnostic criteria for ADHD, um, the symptoms alone are not sufficient enough for a diagnosis. Um, the symptoms have to be clinically meaningful. Uh, they have to provide a clinically meaningful impairment. And the symptoms are most likely ca the cause of the impairment. There are several different areas for diagnostic criteria for ADHD. Uh, criteria for area A, um, which is split into two uh, separate sub-areas, you have to have six or more of the listed symptoms. The symptoms have to be persistent for at least six months. Uh, they are, and they have to be inconsistent with the appropriate developmental level. Um, symptom, symptoms also have to directly impact social or academic or occupational activities. So if the symptoms are not impeding their ability to learn at school, most likely they do not have ADHD. <clears throat> the diagnostic criteria uh, for ADHD in area one for inattention um, six or more of these have to be present for uh, six or more months. Uh, the symptoms are uh, failing to give close attention or making careless mistakes uh, during their uh, work. Difficulty sustaining attention to tasks. Uh, they don't seem to listen when they're spoken to uh, and they don't follow through on instructions. So not only do they not uh, pay attention while someone is speaking directly to them. If you're giving them a request, they most likely don't follow through with those requests. And it's uh, not that they're actively uh, defying, it's just they have an inability to sustain attention. They have difficulty organizing tasks or activities. So children with ADHD uh, that have this type of symptom <clears throat> uh, usually have extreme difficulty um, getting things together for a long-term assignment at school. So uh, they would probably need some type of accommodation to help them uh, stay organized. They avoid dislike or uh, have a reluctance uh, to engage in difficult tasks, uh, more so than children without ADHD. Uh, they will usually try to do uh, engage in escape behaviors uh, that lead to the avoidance of these types of difficult tasks. And it's mainly because it makes them uncomfortable uh, because they can't sustain their attention for long periods of time. They often uh, lose things necessary for tasks. Uh, they're extremely 
um, easily distractible, and they often forget um, routine daily activities. So children with ADHD um, tend to have difficulty remembering what to do in the morning to get ready for school, or um, have they have difficulty getting things together to bring home um, for schoolwork. Also under area A, uh, we have area two for hyperactivity. Uh, the types of symptoms you might see for hyperactivity, they'll fidget or tap their hands or they'll squirm in their seat. They just have a really hard time sitting still um, when compared with their peers. Uh, they'll often leave their seat when they're expected to stay seated. So children with ADHD are usually the ones you probably see walking around a classroom uh, when they are supposed to be sitting down and working. And that might also um, be part of the escape behavior under the uh, inattentive uh, area. They'll often run or climb uh, when it's inappropriate. Uh, this is mostly seen during free play, especially in uh, areas like playgrounds or parks. Uh, they're usually the ones that are climbing uh, on areas of playground equipment that aren't safe. Uh, and usually other children have the ability to contain those impulses to cr climb uh, in areas that aren't appropriate. Uh, they're unable to play quietly. Children with ADHD uh, with this type of hyperactive symptom uh, are usually much louder when compared to their peers uh, during free play. Um, they seem on the go or driven by a motor. It's like sometimes um, children with ADHD with this symptom um, are constantly moving. It's like they have a, an inability to stop. Um, they'll talk excessively or blurt out answers. Um, and <clears throat> they'll also have difficulty waiting turns and often disrupt uh, or interrupt others. Criterion B, um, several criteria A's uh, um, have to be present prior to the age of 12. Criterion C, uh, several criteria A have to be present in two or more settings. So it can't just be at home. It has to be uh, present in other settings as well, like school or in public. For criterion D, uh, there has to be clear evidence that the symptoms are interfering or reduce the quality of social, academic, or occupational functioning. If the symptoms that are present for ADHD are not interfering with school or not interfering with job performance, then most likely there can be something else that can explain the behavior rather than a diagnosis of ADHD. For criterion E, uh, the symptoms do not occur excessively during the course of another psychotic disorder. So this is your rule out criterion. Um, if, they're, if they are currently in the middle of a manic phase of manic depression, the manic depression will explain these symptoms uh, more appropriately than a diagnosis of ADHD. So there's several diagnostic areas for ADHD. Uh, there can be a combined presentation where both area one and area two are met for the past six months. So this is ADHD, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. There can be predominantly inattentive presentation. This is where the symptoms that are present for ADHD are only in area one, and they've been present for at least six months. Uh, and then finally, predominantly hyperactive or impulse, impulsive presentation. This is uh, symptoms that are only in area two that have been present for the past six months. There are some specifiers uh, for the diagnosis of ADHD. It can be in partial remission, which means that the full criteria that was, was previously met has not been present for the last six months. That, this means that the symptoms of ADHD were present prior to the previous six months, um, but they are not currently being seen. And then there can also be mild, moderate, or severe presentation. 
So the prevalence and demographics of ADHD, there have been two studies to date in the United States that have shown uh, that between 7.4 and 9.9% prevalence in the general population, um, which is actually seems to be kind of low for the presentation of ADHD. Uh, and then demographics from those studies have shown that male cases are three to seven times more likely than cases of ADHD in females, and that the clinical characteristics do not vary by sex. So um, the presentation of ADHD in girls is usually similar to the presentation of ADHD in boys. Uh, girls don't seem to have more of one area than the other, and boys are the same way. Situational contextual factors. Uh, there can be significant fluctuations of symptoms seen across different contexts. Uh, playing alone versus playing with others. Uh, the symptoms of ADHD may be more prevalent in one situation than the other. Uh, when dad is home versus when just mom is home. Usually because mom is present more in the household, you will see these behaviors more prevalent when she is home as opposed to when dad is home, who is the primary disciplinarian in the situation. Or it could be vice versa. It depends on the uh, household. Uh, it can also seem to fluctuate when the parent's attention is divided. And this can also go for any adult attention being divided. Uh, for example, if a parent gets a phone call and the child is under control, sometimes the symptoms of, AD, of a child's ADHD will become worse when the parent's attention is directed toward the phone call because they, do, they require a constant reminder of what the expectations are. Comorbid impairments for ADHD. Children with ADHD do actually have a higher likelihood of developing oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, depression, and bipolar disorder. The severity of the ADHD may in part predict the severity or the risk of any of these comorbid conditions. So what that means is the worse the symptoms of ADHD, it becomes a better predictor of one of these other comorbid conditions. And the likelihood of having a comorbidity with ADHD, 80% uh, of ADHD cases have, or excuse me, 87% of ADHD cases have a, what usually have one other disorder. 67% of ADHD cases have at least two other comorbid disorders. There are several possible uh, etiologies for ADHD. One could be neurological. Uh, some research uh, of siblings has shown uh, that with siblings with ADHD have the same executive functioning deficits. Um, so there seems to be a genetic neurological, um, excuse me, there seems to be a neurological connection uh, in families uh, that have ADHD present in one sibling or more. There is a, a possible genetic etiology for ADHD. Uh, subsequent si siblings of uh, children with ADHD have a 32% higher risk of also having ADHD. So if your oldest child has ADHD, there is a much higher risk of subsequent children having the same disability. If the parent has ADHD, then children uh, of those parents have 40 to 57% higher risk of having ADHD as well. Which leads us to uh, the assessment of ADHD. Now that we understand how ADHD is diagnosed and um, how the symptoms are uh, presented, the, uh, we need to talk, begin talking about the goals of assessment. So the goals of assessment are to determine the presence or absence of ADHD in any comorbid conditions. Um, so the goal is to determine whether or not there is ADHD present or if there's another dis disorder that can better explain the symptomology. 
Um, you have to determine the child's strengths and weaknesses for consideration while planning treatment. So uh, this goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, ADHD is not the same between one person and another. So one treatment may work for one child. Another treatment may work for another. Uh, so there's no blanket treatment for ADHD. You have to take into consideration the individual child's strengths and weaknesses. Um, you should develop targeted interventions for the disorder and any other psychological, academic, or social impairments. So the treatment um, uh, has to include um, interventions to help curb the symptomology of the ADHD. The treatments should also consider the caregivers, caregivers' levels of readiness. If the caregivers are not um, adequately trained or do not have the adequate amount of skills to deal with ADHD symptomology, the treatment that is being used should take their levels into consideration as well, not just the child. So uh, the qualifications for a minimally acceptable evaluation. There are four cornerstone, cornerstones of an ADHD evaluation, a parent rating scale, a teacher rating scale, a semi-structured interview, and then a physical examination if there is a medical history um, of other uh, impairments. Um, there's a reason why there's more than one rating scale. Like we said, if the symptoms are not present in more than one setting, then it's probably not ADHD, which is why we get a rating scale from parents and teachers. For the parent rating scale, um, of course, with, like with any evaluation, it should start broad and then narrow down um, to rule out any other disorders. Um, some examples of um, parent rating scales would be the BASC-2 parent rating scale, uh, the CBCL or the Child Behavior Checklist, and the DBD. For teacher rating scales, uh, teacher ratings are taken for two reasons. One is that children that don't have academic or behavioral problems at school most likely do not have ADHD. Um, what this means is since the symptomology for ADHD is compared to developmental levels, uh, teachers are a better reliable source of information when it comes to comparing the child's behavior to his peers. The teacher is going to have a better understanding of what is more acceptable for a child of a certain developmental level. Uh, this is mainly due to the fact that parents don't have as many data points to compare against. Um, the teacher rating scale for elementary teachers tend to be more accurate than for secondary teachers, which is uh, middle school or high school teachers. And this is mainly due to the fact that elementary teachers uh, spend more time with the child. Um, usually in secondary schools like middle and high school, uh, children are changing classes uh, roundabouts hourly, and so the teachers don't spend as much time with them. Uh, and since the expectations in each setting are probably different, the symptomology um, can be um, greater or less depending on the teacher. <clears throat> Minimally acceptable evaluation should also include a semi-structured interview. Uh, the interview should focus on influences on behavior, uh, parental skills and knowledge to help uh, develop the treatment plan after the evaluation. It should include a developmental history uh, in case there are any uh, medical um, problems uh, in birth that may also be causing some of the symptomology, uh, and any other various treatments or efforts to change the behavior. If there has already been an attempt to change the behavior and it was not successful, then the treatment plan should probably not include those attempts. Uh, and then lastly, the physical examination. Uh, this would only be uh, needed if the developmental history showed that there is possible physical cause of the ADHD symptoms. Um, 
and then that part of the examination would need to be done by a medical doctor. The ADHD checkup is the minimally accepted evaluation that will eventually lead to intervention. It is, is a parent-focused assessment process that has been modified in effort to provide the best impact of a multimodal assessment for ADHD. The phases of the ACU include telephone contact, semi-structured interview with parents, of videotaped interactions between the family members and collaborative feedback with the parents. The history and the background of the ACU <clears throat> come from um, earlier brief family intervention. It comes from the theory of motivational interviewing, which is consistent with the principles of the trans theoretical model of change. The ACU is the first application of this theory to family therapy and the ACU procedures are consistent with the best application of behavioral parent training. Another part of the history and background of the ACU is that it consists of five changes of readiness for, for change. The first one is the pre-contemplative stage, meaning that there is no intention to change. The second one is the contemplation stage, which means that they're aware of the problem, they're thinking about overcoming the problem, but they haven't made a commitment to take action. The next one is the preparation stage, which intends to take action or has been trying to take action. The fourth <clears throat> one is the action stage, <clears throat> which um, includes modifying behavior or environment to overcome the problem. And then the fifth one is the maintenance stage, which is the person has already started changing and they're trying to overcome the problem and now they're working to consolidate gains in its, that are attained during the action stage. The initial telephone contact is an essential part of the ACU. Um, this is where treatment first begins. The major goal of the ACU is to develop a positive relationship between the family and the therapist from the very beginning. This defines the process of obtaining services um, it helps to invest the family in the help-seeking process, as well as to explore any other barriers that the family might be facing. Call early and call often is a very um, important thing to remember whenever you're thinking of making an appointment. So motivational interviewing techniques include expressing empathy and rolling with persistence. The major goals of the ACU phone calls are to communicate interest and concern to promote a positive therapeutic relationship, to overcome ambivalence about change, and to begin to socialize family members toward the most effective interactions and assessment in their therapy. Preparing for telephone contact, um, you need to make sure that you have reviewed all available data and that you're not asking questions that you don't already know the answer to. The semi-structured interview, the goals of the getting to know you session, which is what we're going to talk about next, are to develop rapport and trust, to better understand the caregiver's interests and concerns, to motivate interest in completing all three steps of the ACU. The getting to know you session with the parents. Meet with the parents and use the getting to know you form. <clears throat> Make sure that you complete a problem checklist. Complete a genogram and diagram of social supports. Rank order the top problems. Complete a thorough discussion <clears throat> of top problems. Developmental and social history are also important to talk about with the parents. Confirm an appointment for um, the FAST or family assessment task. Identify um, conflict to discuss, to discuss during the FAST and um, also to explain questionnaires that are to be completed prior to the FAST. Okay, the family assessment task, or the FAST, the, part, the first part of this um, is for two parents or two caregivers, and that's just basically to have a parenting discussion. The second part is for the parents and for the target child, and that is to encourage growth, monitoring and listening, and to talk about the family conflict. The third part is for the entire family. 
Um, and during this session, you're going to do some problem solving, talk about substance use, planning an activity, um, positive recognition, as well as debriefing the entire session to make sure that everyone is on the same page at the end of the um, third part of the activities too. The feedback session. In order to prepare for the feedback session, it's important to gather collateral information, such as teacher ratings, scoring questionnaires, the evaluation of the FAST, and the drafting information, as well as the feedback from the Finley Checkup Score. Um, primary considerations of the feedback meeting would also include to um, provide feedback and discuss any need for change. The goal of this session is to put families in an active role so that they can take responsibility for change without being bullied or left feeling, or, or left feeling powerless. Some more elements of the feedback session are for the caregivers to provide a self-assessment. Um, the first part of this is for the child's um, strengths and need for improvement, the caregiver and family strengths and need for improvement, the contextual protective and risk factors, as well as to make a menu of available resources. The caregivers commit to pursuing one or more items on the menu. There are four phases of the feedback session. The first one is self-assessment. The second is clarification and support. The third is summarizing feedback. And the final stage is what we call frames or the intervention selections. Frames consist of feedback on family status, emphasis on family, responsibility for change, the advice about change options listed on the menu, collaborative listing of change options, a menu by which change might be achieved, Empathetic um, counseling style, as well as self-efficacy self for change that is supported. Some symptoms of ADHD include um, parents describing their understanding of ADHD. The caregivers are shown a graphs, um, shown graphs from the BASC two and from the DVD, and this will help them to kind of better understand the symptoms of ADHD. Summarizing the feedback and getting a consensus from the parents can lead to a development of a goal. Um, intervention options based on the goal that is selected. Um, we would brainstorm those, um, brainstorm a list of the intervention options. The therapist would model brainstorming to generate the options. The therapist would also promote discussion of the pros and cons of each option. And then um, the options for the menu items are Some other symptoms of ADHD include the adult functioning portion. Um, the intervention for ADHD is heavily dependent on the adult caregiver, as well as the parent and child interactions. Information taken from the CIRS, the BASC-2, and the FAST would um, help to better understand the parent and child interactions. To briefly review the information and for the caregivers to identify goals and methods for achieving the overall goal. Peer relations are also another um, symptom for ADHD. Peer functioning almost always includes areas of strengths as well as areas of weakness. The BASC-2 scores um, and the Academic Rating Scale would give us an indication of peer relations. <clears throat> to discuss best friends in terms of depth and stability of the relationship is also um, a good way to assess peer relations. Feedback with the child or the adolescent, there are four phases, the self-assessment, the support and clarification, the feedback, the selection of goals, and the change op options. The child review, to review the problem, the problems, the goals, the options developed by the parents. And then there's a feedback sheet that has additional problems and would state personal goals and suggest solutions. The discussion with the therapist, um, in this in this portion, you would discuss how the adolescent will communicate their goals and the menu of change options to the parents, and the therapist will support the child by facilitating the discussion with the parents. The menu of treatment options um, for ADHD diagnosis comes with the, with the area of significantly impaired functioning related to ADHD. 
And under this, there is a well-conducted evaluation that provides a clear understanding of the functional impairments and the basis for treatment. Um, it is also a competent intervention, includes monitoring of target problems and other relevant areas of function. Some treatment recommendations <clears throat> with parent counseling about the disorder. Children with few or no impairments um, may fit into this area. Residential treatment, children who have severe, chronic, or dangerous forms of conduct problems or depression would fit in this area. Medication, um, classroom behavioral interventions, parent training and effective child management procedures, and then behavioral problem solving approach to fam family therapy, as well as individual or group social skills training. Multimodal treatments um, are evidence-based they complement each other by creating a synergy of effectiveness. They're not always best to change everything at once, and it is not always best to take or to tackle the most difficult problem first. Treatment selection considerations. Medication might potentially lower parent motivation to get involved in behavioral interventions. Medication alone might be all that is required for uncomplicated it is important to select treatment options that result in success and enhance parent motivation and parenting efficacy. Working on behavioral behavior that occurs at home may be the best way to start in order to engage the parents in the change process. Medications. There are some, some different types of medications that are used to treat ADHD. Stimulants and non-stimulants. And then medications are not necessary nor sufficient to treat ADHD. 10 to 25% of children with ADHD do not benefit from the treatment of this type from treatment of this type of stimulant medication. Stimulant drugs are not able to address all difficulties of ADHD in children who do not respond to drugs properly. Medication can be an indispensable part of the treatment program and often the most effective. Some primary effects of medications, uh, they improve attention span, decrease impulsivity, diminish task irrelevant activity, and decrease disrupting behavior. Some secondary effects, increase compliance to commands and instructions, increase productivity on academic assignments, improve peer interactions, increase peer acceptance, um, decrease parent and teacher reprimands, and supervision and punishment. Combined treatment is better effective than Parent training and contingency management consists of several different factors that determine parent training. Information from the initial evaluation, the child's symptoms of ADHD, the level of non-compliant or defiant behaviors at home, the parent's educational and intellectual level, the degree of motivation for treatment, the parental depression, stress, and personal psychopathology, as well as sufficient There are several different programs uh, for parent training and contingency management. There's the Barkley, the Robin Foster, the Patterson, the Borgach, and the Sanders training plan. Some classroom interventions that could be used <clears throat> are to train teachers in contingency management methods, token reinforcement programs, home-based evaluation or reinforcement programs, increased attention um, to child compliance by teachers, in class time out procedures, behavioral contracts, intensive structure of special classroom, after school programs, um, or parent treatment schools. <clears throat> the intensity of classroom interventions should be based on findings from evaluation that includes the level of the child's school behavior and performance um, of problems, the degree of parent and teacher commitment to complying with these methods, the extent of previous school interventions, the stimulant medication, whether or, not, whether or not it is present, and the eligibility for special educational programs, as well as effectiveness and enhancement. Evaluation of response to intervention. There are highly variable responses to parenting interventions and classroom contingency. Non-response to stimulant medication is around 
ADHD intervention cases need to be individualized and evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Individual variability, there are long baselines using a reversal design or an ABAD design that has multiple data points. It is um, in contrast to the pre and post test evaluations that are often conducted to evaluate, evaluate response to interventions. Choice of measures. Measures should be sensitive to change. They should be valid and feasible to administer better frequently. Collateral report comprised of uh, ratings on standardized measures, objective measures that uh, have uh, direct observation of frequencies and behavior. The Connors CGI measure is one of these, and uh, behavioral tracking is another one of these. Now we would like to speak a little bit about legal and ethical issues um, surrounding a diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, first, before uh, you begin an evaluation for ADHD, um, you have to take into consideration custody or guardianship of the child. Um, children with ADHD uh, tend to come from families with uh, from uh, separation or divorce. So uh, you have to really take into consideration who can request an evaluation on a disability. Um, if there's joint custody, you have to determine who is the primary, who has primary guardianship, and if it's shared, you have to make sure you maintain or you gain consent uh, from both parties. Um, <clears throat> you also have a duty to report. Uh, studies have shown that children with ADHD uh, are at a greater risk for abuse um, due to the parents being under greater stress that stems from the child's behavior. So because most parents of children with ADHD don't, uh, more often than not, don't have the uh, skills to be able to manage ADHD behavior, uh, they can tend to react a little bit more violently than parents uh, who do have the skills and knowledge to deal with these types of behaviors. Um, any suspicion of physical or sexual abuse or neglect of a child that arises um, or is reported during the evaluation must be reported. Um, and as, um, as people in uh, the profession of diagnosing uh, disabilities or disorders, um, you should routinely forewarn uh, parents of your duty to report. Um, ser providing services for children with disabilities. Uh, children with ADHD do have access to government entitlements. Um, for example, educational services. If a child is diagnosed with a disorder of ADHD, they can be served uh, through the Individuals with Disabilities Act uh, under the category of other health impairment. Uh, this means that they would be able, uh, if they are diagnosed through the schools, uh, which is separate from a diagnosis in the private profession, then they would be diagnosed under the category of other health impairment, and then they would have access to special education uh, services within the school setting. Um, if the ADHD symptomology is sufficiently uh, serious and it significantly interferes with academic performance, um, but the school decides that they don't meet the required, excuse me, they don't meet the criteria for ADHD diagnosis in the school, then they are also uh, could qualify for what's called a Section 504. Um, and this is through the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And basically what a 504 is, um, it provides accommodations for children with ADHD in the classroom um, for those who are not under an IEP. So they can get the same types of accommodations that children in special services receive. However, it's not through an IEP, it's through what's called a 504. Um, also, children with significantly severe ADHD um, in low-income families can, may also be eligible 
uh, for financial assistance under the Social Security uh, Act. Uh, this is under the disability portion of the Social Security Act, and it can not only do they have access to um, financial assistance, but they may also have uh, be able to gain access to support services, or what's called in the schools wraparound services, which can provide training and support for parents to help them deal with uh, problem ADHD behaviors. Another concern with children with ADHD is, should they be legally held accountable for their own actions? Um, is ADHD an excuse to behave irresponsibly without being held accountable for the consequences of one's actions? Well, for some, the answer is a little unclear. Uh, due to impulsivity, if they're so impulsive that they can't control what they're doing, should they still be held accountable? Well, there is one opinion that I would like to point out, which comes from Barclay, um, who is one of the leading researchers in the field of ADHD. His opinion is that ADHD provides an explanation for why certain be impulsive acts may have been committed, but it does not constitute sufficient disturbance of mental faculties to serve as an excuse from legal accountability. What this means is that a diagnosis of ADHD explains why someone acts the way they do. However, because they still have the mental ability to understand right from wrong, Barclay is saying that they probably should still be held accountable for their behaviors.